So now we're going to talk about colligative properties. Um, if you've ever made ice cream at home, um, the old-fashioned way, you know that you put ice in the bucket and you have to put salt on the ice. Um, have you ever tried to take popsicles or ice cream to a picnic in a cooler packed with ice? Anybody ever tried to do that? Good, because it doesn't work. Why do we use salt in the ice cream maker? Because the salt makes the ice colder. Salt lowers the temperature at which the solution freezes, and you can get it down to about minus 10 degrees Celsius. What's the temperature at which ice normally melts? Zero. Zero. Okay, so we can get it 10 degrees colder. And we're actually going to do that this afternoon. We're going to have ice, and we're going to take its temperature, and we're going to put salt on it and take the temperature again. And we should see temperatures down around minus 10. Um, so this is called freezing point depression because the freezing point is depressed. It's lowered. This is a colligative property. Colligative properties depend on the number of particles that are dissolved in the solution they don't depend on what those particles are. So there's a small group of colligative properties, and it has to do with how many particles there are. Um, you'll get more effect from electrolytes than non-electrolytes because a mole of electrolyte is going to form more than one mole of particles. Come on. There we go. So when we put something like sodium chloride into solution, it dissociates into sodium ions and chloride ions. So if you start with one mole of sodium chloride, you're going to get approximately one mole of sodium ions and one mole of chlorine ions, chloride ions. That's two moles of particles. It doesn't matter that one's sodium and one's chloride. It doesn't matter at all. If you do a mole of sugar, you're going to get a mole of particles dissolved because sugar doesn't ionize. So freezing point depression is a colligative property. Vapor pressure lowering is also a colligative property. It, the vapor pressure of a solution with a non-electrolyte in it is going to be lower than the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So we've talked about the dynamic equilibrium that occurs um, between a liquid and its gas in a closed container. And the pressure of gas here is called the vapor pressure of the liquid. So here we have our dynamic equilibrium. If we throw something in here, little red molecules in with the blue, the, the simplest way to think of it is that these red balls get in the way of the blue ones. Because in order for these blue ones to evaporate, they have to be at the surface. They have to be moving toward the surface and get to the surface. The red ones now are in the way. We talked about an analogy of this like playing Red Rover. Well, now these red ones are like people standing in front of the Red Rover line. And you can't even get to the Red Rover line to break through. So the effect here is that the rate of evaporation is lowered, is slowed. So less evaporation, the rate of um, condensation is going to um, be roughly the same. as. So we've got things condensing, and then this one will slow down eventually to match that one. And so we end up with fewer gas particles and a lower vapor pressure. <coughs> So we still get an equilibrium, but there's fewer molecules in the gas phase. Does that make sense? I kind of, that, that wasn't my best explanation. Nothing, nothing that happens today is going to be my best. I'll just tell you that right now. It's not going to be. Um, a more fundamental explanation of this is nature's tendency toward mixing. An increase in entropy. We talked about that yesterday, entropy. So... This is really cool, and you could try this at home. So if you put a beaker, say with pure water, 
and a beaker of concentrated sugar water, and you put them in the same large airtight container and leave them. It may take a while. It's not going to happen in five minutes. Come back maybe five days later. The level of water is higher in the beaker containing the sugar water and lower in the pure water. That's not what you would really expect to happen, is it? I, you know, it's like, why would it do that? It's related to the idea of osmosis. Okay, Nature is trying to mix things and have everything become uniform. So we have solvent evaporating here. We have solvent evaporating here. But the solvent evaporates at a lower rate here because of this solute here that's getting in the way. The rate of uh, condensation is going to be the same. Since this one is evaporating slower, but condens condensation is happening at, at the same rate, this one is going to get more water in it eventually. But the effect here is that this is being diluted. Just like when we talked about osmosis, when you drink salt water, the wa it draws the water out of your body into your intestines. It's trying to equalize the concentration. And the force behind that is entropy, the increase in the spread of energy. Any questions about that? It's kind of weird. Well, of course, we can quantify these things. So vapor pressure lowering um, is quantified with Raoult's law. The partial pressure, <coughs> excuse me, the vapor pressure of the solution is going to be equal to the mole fraction of solvent times the, the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. And of course, that has to be at the same temperature that the solution is. So the vapor pressure is going to be directly proportional to the amount of solvent in the solution. If the mole fraction for the solvent is 1, meaning you have pure solvent, then the pressure of the solution will be equal to the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. And the lower this number gets, the lower the pressure gets for the solution. So the change in vapor pressure is equal to the, um, you, can, you can derive this, but I don't think you want to. Uh, the change in vapor pressure is equal to the mole fraction of the solute times the original vapor pressure of the pure solvent. So calculate the vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius of a solution containing 55.3 grams of ethylene glycol and 285.2 grams of water, the vapor pressure of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is 238 torr. Okay, so we want the vapor pressure of the solution. So the vapor pressure of the solution is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent times the vapor pressure of the pure solvent. That's Raoult's law. So they give us the vapor pressure of the water. It's 200, I'm sorry, 23.8 torr. And we need to find the mole fraction. Guess why we talked about mole fraction yesterday? because we need it for these. So how do we find the mole fraction? We have some calculating to do, huh? We, we need the mole fraction of solvent. Let's put it up here. That's the H2O. Will be the number of moles of H2O divided by the number of moles of H2O plus 
the number of moles of, I'll just call it EG, ethylene glycol. Usually we calculate the mole fraction of the solute, but here it calls for the solvent. So we need the moles of these guys. Um, 55.3 grams of ethylene glycol, and we need moles. Well, they gave us the formula. Um, let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 8 hydrogens. And 3 carbons. Well, I screwed up my on my cell phone calculator already, and it's time to bust out the real guy. I really need one that I can open with one hand. Okay, we can do this. Two, four, six, eight. Okay, eight, eight hydrogens and three carbons. Three times twelve point oh one and two oxygens. I'm getting seventy six point oh nine. Okay. Seventy six point oh nine grams <coughs> times uh, so the number of moles then is going to be point seven two um, six seven moles of the ethylene glycol. And I'm writing way, way, way too big, and so it's not fitting. So then this one's going to be way too small. 285.2 uh, grams of water. Divide by the molar mass of water. Uh, maybe you know now why I have that one memorized, because we end up using it so much. Divided by 18.02. And this gives me 15.8269, no, yeah, 6 moles. But the uncertainty would be, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, right there. So we'll go up here to calculate our mole fraction. Uh, the water is 15.8269. 8269, and here we have 15.8269 plus the 0 0.7267, ooh, squeezed it in there, sorry, this is ugly today. Um, that's going to end up with two decimal places, um, which will still have four sig figs and four on the top. So our mole fraction is going to have four significant figures. And I'm coming up with 0 0.956098. One, two, three, four for my mole fraction. Anybody else get that? Well, yeah, if you rounded it, it'd be 061. No. The mole fraction has no units because it's moles divided by moles. So we'll take that mole fraction times 23.8, <coughs> and that gives us, um, and I'll just change the color. The pressure of the solution is 22.8 torr. This has three sig figs, and so my answer will have three sig figs. Questions? 
It was very messy. Now, what we've been talking about so far is if the solute has a, is non-volatile, meaning that it does not vaporize easily. If you have a volatile non-electrolyte solute, then things get a little more complicated because the solute is also vaporizing and that's going to contribute to the vapor pressure of the solution. So just like we had ideal gases, we have ideal solutions. Ideal solutions will follow Reynolds' law at all concentrations for both the solvent and the solute. The total pressure above such a solution would be the sum of the partial pressures of each of the components. Um, but of course there are non-ideal solutions. And these do not follow Reynolds' law because they have solute-solvent interactions that are stronger or weaker than the solvent-solvent interactions and so that affects how they interact. In a pure, I mean in an ideal solution there's not really a big factor from the solute and the solvent molecules interacting with each other. They basically act the same way as if they were a pure liquid. In a non-ideal situation, this is like, you know, you get two kids together and normally they're really quiet, but you get these two together and boy, they can talk. And they cause all kinds of trouble in class and the teachers say, you guys are never being in the same classroom again. And that happens and they never get in the same classroom. Why can't I be with Nikki? Oh, I don't know. That's never happened in my family. Um, so the, because of interactions between the solute and the solvent, um, some solutions do not follow Reynolds' law. So here's uh, some graphs. So let's look at these. Um, so here we have an ideal solution following Reynolds' law. So we have um, component A with the red line and component B with the blue line. And as the amount of A, here we've got the mole fraction of A is increasing. As the mole fraction of A increases, the partial pressure of component A increases, and the partial pressure of component B decreases. So when there is no A in the solution, the vapor pressure is equal to that of pure B. And when there's no B, the pressure is the same as pure A. And in between, they just do these straight lines. And so the vapor pressure of the solution is just the sum of these. So if we drew a line, let's draw a line. If we picked that point right there, this vapor pressure is equal to this one plus that one. It's the total vapor pressure. Any questions about that? There's two components in the solution. They're both vaporizing. And they're doing so relatively independently of each other. And so it just depends on the, on the mole fraction of each. So what happens if we have strong interactions between the solute and the solvent? Well, now these curves are going to sag down. The vapor pressure of component B and the vapor pressure of component A are going to be lower than what they would have been because they're being held by that other component. There's strong interaction between A and B and so they don't vaporize as easily. So both of these are going to sag down below ideal behavior and then what we see in the vapor pressure of the solution is a saggy line with the minimum being roughly in the middle here where you have equal amounts of A and B. 
equal amounts of A and B in terms of moles is going to give you the maximum interaction between them and cause the vapor pressure of the whole solution to be the lowest. If you have weak interactions between the solute and the solvent, it's going to have the opposite effect. So here, these two different components like each other, and they're going to kind of hang on to each other, and they're like, no, no, we don't want to leave. And so the vapor pressure ends up being lower. Here, they don't like each other, but very weak interactions, and so they're actually trying to get away from each other, just, you know, in Mrs. K's chemistry land. They're trying to get away from each other, and so the actual vapor pressure of each component bulges up above the ideal behavior, and so we see this... Um, corresponding bulge in the vapor pressure of the solution. Questions? You know, it's kind of a kind of a random seeming topic, right? Like what on earth are we talking about? I don't think we're going to do any calculations with the non-ideal behavior. There's a lot of these more complicated things where we, we show you how to do the simpler ones, and then we say, oh, and, and here's how things really are. Um, we just want you to know that that's how they are, and if, if, if you need to do that, you'll learn that later. Which is kind of nice about general chemistry, is we can just kind of gloss over some things. Um, let's see. A solution of benzene and toluene is 25% benzene by mass. The vapor pressure of pure benzene and pure toluene at 25 degrees Celsius are 920, 940, 94.2 and 28.2 degrees Celsius. I can't even read today, respectively, assuming ideal behavior. Okay, So we don't have to worry about the bulging lines. Calculate the following. The vapor pressure of each of the solution components in the mixture, the total pressure above the solution and the composition of the vapor in mass percent. Fun? Like, ah. Okay, so this is one of those problems where it can be a little hard to figure out where do I even start, right? Well, how do we find the vapor pressure of a component of the solution? Well, there's a law, an equation that we're going to use, Raoult's law. So we'll call them B and T, B for benzene and T for toluene. So the pressure of benzene is going to equal the mole fraction of benzene times the normal vapor pressure of benzene, right? And We've got a corresponding for the toluene. The, par the pressure for the toluene is going to equal the mole fraction of the toluene times the original vapor pressure of the toluene. So those vapor pressures are given to us. We need a mole fraction. What did they give us? They gave us percent by mass. How thoughtful of them. Not. Well, how do we even approach this? What does 25% benzene by mass mean? It means 25 grams of benzene per 100 grams of solution. We need mole fraction. What if we said, oh, I left the unit out there. What if we said that we've got 100 grams of solution? Could we figure out how many moles of benzene we have? And could we figure out how many moles of toluene we have? Right? Because there's 75 grams of toluene in 100 grams. And then if we have the number of moles, we could do mole fractions, couldn't we? So let's do that. So we've got 25 grams of the benzene 
and we're going to need the molar mass of benzene. Uh, 6 times 12.01 plus 6 times 1.008, 78.11. So 25 divided by 78.11 is equal to 0 0.3. 201 moles. That should have three sig figs. I was sloppy writing the 25. So that's moles of benzene. And then we've got 75 grams of toluene. And toluene is C7H8. So 7 times 12.01 plus 8 times 1.008 equals 92.13 grams. So 75.0 divided by 92.13, 0.13. I'm just going to carry one extra one, round that zero up to a one. That's the moles of toluene. This slide is a doceri iPad disaster. Sorry. You with me? Still? Haven't lost you yet? It's good. Okay. So, yeah, there we go. Whew, that was close. I hate it when that happens. Um, so mole fraction of benzene then. Oh, let's just. We, we don't need to see this yet. And we just really need some space. So the mole fraction of benzene is moles of benzene over moles of benzene plus moles of toluene. So. Put it down here. Moles of benzene, 0 0.3201 moles divided by 0 0.3201 plus 0 0.8141. Now, you know, this is Chem 1A, and so we always pay attention to our significant figures. Always. So in the denominator there, we have 0 0.3201 plus 0 0.8141. That gives me a total, I'll just write it up here, 1.1342. Each of these has uncertainty in the third decimal place, the thousandths. And so when I add those, I get uncertainty in the thousandths. And I actually gained a significant figure there. But I'm going to take that... Uh, that's going to be divided into 0 0.3201. And I'm going to end up with 0 0.28223 as my mole fraction. Because this has three significant figures and my total from the bottom has four, this only has three. So there's my mole fraction for benzene. What's the easy way to get the mole fraction for toluene? Subtract it from 1. They have to add up to 1. So I'm just going to change the sign and add it to 1, and I'll get the mole fraction of toluene. So that'll be 0.71777. Again, with the uncertainty right there. Everybody with me? It's a silly thing to ask because the ones that aren't with me wouldn't even answer that question. So I don't even know why I say that. Of course, there's a lot of things I don't know why I do. So pressure of benzene, mole fraction of benzene, 0 0.28. Two, two, three, uncertainty being there times the normal 
vapor pressure of benzene, which is 94.2 torr. Point two eight two two three times ninety four point two equals. Uh, this is a final result, so I'm going to round it. Twenty six point six tor. And then for the toluene, zero point seven one seven 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 times the vapor pressure 28.4 tor point seven one seven 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 times 28.4 and rounding that off would give us 20.4 tor So that's the answer to the first question. Any questions about that? I'm going to have to erase some of this. Isn't that cool how the letters come back? It's fun. So the total pressure So we got the vapor pressure up above the total pressure above the solution how do we find that Add them together So ideally we should not have rounded them off not written down the answers but yeah, we're going to let that slide That's what, 47.0 yeah. torr. So the total pressure above the solution is just the sum of the vapor pressures of each component. That's not exactly where I wanted to put it, but it's... Oh. I, I didn't want to lose... I didn't want to lose those guys. I do want to lose this, though. So that's the total pressure. Here are mole fractions over there. The composition of the vapor... Well, that's not working, is it? I don't think we really need that. I'll just get rid of it. The concentration of the vapor in mass percent. There'll be two, ma two mass percents that add up to 100. So, how would we do that? We can't use the 25%. That's the solution. We know the partial pressures, right? There was a relationship between the total pressure of a gas mixture and the mole fraction of the gas and its individual partial pressure. There was. It's not in this chapter. It's from a previous chapter. Yeah, we do that. We assume that you remember stuff from like two weeks ago. The, um, the partial pressure of gas B is equal to the mole fraction of gas B times the total pressure. 
So here we know the total pressure and we know the partial pressure, we just calculated it. So we can find the mole fraction of B in the vapor. Oh, I like that. Little, little light bulb glimmer there, I like that. So the mole fraction, oh good grief, I, I need to revise this slide because there's just nowhere to do anything. And we don't need these guys anymore. And we don't need that. We are looking for the composition of the vapor in mass percent. It's just a lovely thing to be asking. But to, to do that, we're, the, the only way we can get there is through mole, mole fraction. So this is, this is the mole fraction. The mole fraction of B in the gas state will be equal to the partial pressure of B divided by the total pressure. That's a capital T. So the partial pressure of B we calculated was 26.6 torr and the total pressure was 47.0 torr. And so our mole fraction is 26.6 divided by 47 which equals 0 0.56 Five nine six. That's a mole fraction. It doesn't have a unit. And this would have uncertainty right there. <coughs> so we're, we're trying to get to mass percent. For mass percent, we need a mass of one substance and the mass of the whole mixture, right? Mass percent is the mass of the part divided by the mass of the whole times 100. Well, this gives us the, the mole fraction of benzene, which means that there's 0.56596 moles of benzene for every one mole of the combined, right? That's what it means. So what if we say that we have one mole of this mixture? Then we could figure out how many moles of toluene we have. We have to do this sometimes. We have to make these assumptions. Because it, it doesn't matter how much you have, the mole fraction is always the same. And so we'll just, we're just choosing an amount that makes it easy. So we're saying, let's say we have one mole of the mixture. So of the mixture, one mole, then this number, well, let's just do it this way. That will end up, for one mole, equaling the moles of benzene. for one mole mixture. And then the moles of toluene would be one minus the moles of the benzene. Zero point four three four oh four moles of the toluene. From that information, could we calculate the mass percent? Do we have to? Yeah, we have to, sorry. Well, it's too bad that we erased the uh, molar masses. Do you guys have that written down, perhaps? Molar mass of toluene? Pardon me? 92.13, so we'll get that one taken care of. So, 39.988 grams of toluene, and then G 
Just scribbling in here. Um, that's moles, and it was 78 point what? One one. one one. Grams of benzene per mole. Point five six four five six. I can't read my own writing. Five nine six times seventy eight point one one. Forty four point two oh. Forty four point two oh seven. Grams. So percent benzene will equal forty four point two oh seven divided by forty four point two oh seven plus thirty nine point nine eight eight times 100 okay I came up with 52.5 percent anybody else get that Sure, sure we did. Anything to make you stop. And what's the mat what's the percent by mass of toluene? Forty-seven point This is the, the mass of the one mole of vapor because we, we got a mole fraction and we said let's assume we have one mole of the mixture then we can know how many moles of B and T we have and we converted those into grams using their molar masses and so in that one mole we have 44.2 grams of benzene and 39.98 grams of toluene. So the mass of the whole thing is those added together. And we end up with 52.5% benzene, and the remainder, 47.5%, must be toluene. This percentage of benzene is not the same as the percentage of benzene in the solution. Why? Nope, not the molar mass. What else is different about them? Their molar masses are different, but that's not the reason. What about their vapor pressures? The vapor pressure of benzene is 94. The vapor pressure of toluene is 28. Benzene is more volatile than toluene. It evaporates more easily. And so the mixture of gas above it is going to have more benzene than percentage-wise than the solution did because benzene vaporizes more easily. Does that make sense? Okay, one person said yes. We'll, yes. we'll call that good. <laughs> Any questions about this bear of a problem? I don't think there'll be one like this on the test. But I don't think. I, I haven't read, read over the test. So what I like about this problem, though, is that it demonstrates this need for being able to think, right? And we ha we're pulling stuff from different places, and we're pulling it together and solving some kind of hairy problems. And this is assuming ideal behavior. 
So we really don't want to go into non-ideal behavior, do we? So here's our um, phase diagram again. That vapor pressure lowering is going to occur at all temperatures. And so here in the blue, we have the pure solvent. If we add a solute to it, the vapor pressure will be lowered. So the vapor pressure will be lowered at all temperatures. And here's one atmosphere. And the temperature at which we have a transition between solid and liquid is the melting point. And what happened to the melting point? It got shifted lower. Over here, the transition between liquid and gas is the boiling point, and that got shifted higher. The boiling point is the point at which the vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure. So you raise the vapor pressure of a liquid. I'm sorry, you lower the vapor pressure of a liquid, and that causes the boiling point to go up. So I think um, one of the things that I always had a hard time remembering was which one goes up and which one goes down, right? So they move out is what they do. They move away from each other, meaning that this solution will be a liquid over a larger range of temperatures. So the freezing point goes down, the boiling point goes up. They're going away. That's how I remember it. By adding a solute that lowers the vapor pressure and causes the boiling point and freezing point to shift. So the solution has a lower melting point, higher boiling point. So freezing point depression is the change in the freezing point. So here we have our little equation. Delta TF, the change in the freezing point. This is generally reported as a positive number. So here we are um, disregarding negative signs. This is the change. And so what you have to remember is which direction is the change. The change is that it goes down. The change is a function of the molality, the moles per kilogram of solvent, and a factor. So this is a constant, and it will be the constant for the solvent. So Kf is the freezing point depression constant for the solvent. These are some boiling points and freezing point depression constants and boiling point elevation constants for some solvents. Um, so this is a table like this is something you would need to refer to to solve these problems because you need to know the normal freezing point, if you're calculating um, the depressed freezing point, and you need to find, you need to know the, the constant as well. So this is where we would get that information. You would not memorize that. Although I do expect you to know the boiling point and freezing point of water. Zero and a hundred. This is not that hard. So the constant is how much The constant, the constant is, uh, well, if we look at the unit, it's degrees Celsius per molal. So for every molal of increase in concentration, that's the shift in the, in the temperature. So this problem, calculate the freezing point of a 2.6 molal aqueous sucrose solution. So we need the freezing point depression constant for water, which is 1.86. So we looked that up. Kf is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. The change in the freezing point is equal to the molality times Kf. So here, weren't they kind? They gave us the molality. They didn't make us jump through hoops and stand in our head. So we just put that in. 2.6 molal times the 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal. I hate that unit. But there it is. Times 1.86. So we get 4.86.
sorry, 4.836 degrees Celsius, the molals cancel out. Uh, how many significant figures should that number have? Two. So, 4.8. So does that mean the freezing point is 4.8? No, because that would be higher than the freezing point of water. That's the change. And so to find the freezing point, the freezing point will be the normal freezing point of water minus the change because we remember that it goes down. So that's, that's some real hard math there, isn't it? What does that end up being? Minus 4.8. Kidding? No, I'm just being silly. So the temperature then that it would freeze at would be minus 4.8. Any questions? That one seemed like really easy compared to the last one, didn't it? The boiling point is elevated. Same kind of an equation. The change in the boiling point is the molality times a constant, the boiling point elevation constant. <coughs> so, hopefully if you drive a car, you know that you should not have pure water in your radiator, right? Um, here we don't really worry that much about things freezing, but we do th worry about things boiling over. The radiator fluid cools your engine your engine gets very hot, especially when it's very hot outside. And so you don't want the liquid that's in your radiator to boil. That's when you see cars at the side of the road and there's all this clouds of steam coming out. The radiator's boiling over. So we use antifreeze, um, ethylene glycol. Um, and what it does is it lowers the freezing point and simultaneously raises the boiling point. So it's a win-win. So it boils at a higher temperature, meaning it does a better job of cooling off your car because it's not going to boil over as easily. Um, in the Midwest where I grew up, you do worry about your engine freezing solid in the winter, and so you need antifreeze in there so that that doesn't freeze solid. Because when water freezes, it expands, and then it'll break all kinds of things. I mean, it breaks up roads, it cracks concrete, it's... Freezing water is a powerful, powerful thing. Crushes boats when they get caught in the ice. So calculate the boiling point of a 3.6 molar aqueous sucrose solution. Well, we've got the molality. We need Kb, the uh, freezing point elevation constant. So we're going to go back to our table and look that up. It's 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. So the change in the boiling point is going to equal the molality times, is it 612? 512, thank you. It's like, oh my goodness, it left my brain. 0. 0.512 degrees per molal. The molals cancel out. So 3.5. 60 times 0.512. The change is 1.8432 degrees Celsius. This should have three significant figures. But it's not asking us for the change, it's asking us for the boiling point. So we have to take the regular boiling point of water, 100 degrees, and add. So how do we deal with the sig figs here? How many significant figures does that 100 have? Infinite. The Celsius scale is defined by the freezing and boiling points of water. And so the 100 and the 0 would be an infinite number of significant figures. So then it's just however many this one has. So it'll end up being 101.84 degrees Celsius would be the increase in the boiling point.
Any questions? Another colligative property is osmotic pressure. We talked about osmosis a little bit. It's the flow of solvent from a solution with lower concentration to one of higher. And, you know, this is another one of those remembering the direction thing. So what I remember is nature is trying to level everything. It's trying to equalize. Water flows down and it always, you know, levels out. You don't have lumps in the water. Everything's going, trying to be level. So we have high concentration, we have low concentration. It's going to do what it can to mix those up and get them equal. Now, it can't always do that, but it's going to try. So it's going to, the solvent goes, Isn't that it is. Okay. Fabulous. I was just, just realizing that. Nice, nice one. Higher. No, 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 no. It's right. It's right. It's it's right. You guys are messing with me. I'm messing with myself. Um, if the solvent leaves the lower concentration, that raises the concentration. The solvent going to the higher concentration lowers it. It's confusing, right? And so you have to be able to step back and think about it, or you can really play games with yourself when you're taking an exam. But this is the process by which drinking seawater would cause you to become dehydrated. Um, a semi-permeable membrane, semi means part, permeable, so it's partially permeable. It selectively allows some substances to pass through, but not others. And biological cells contain semi-permeable membranes. That's what keeps them intact. Otherwise, you'd just be a mass of goo on the floor. So all of your cells have semi-permeable membranes around the outside and then around various inside parts as well. So what's osmotic pressure? Well, we can set something up like this. Um, these are called U-tubes because they're shaped like U's. And, you know, when I was in college, that wasn't so funny. But now YouTube is a channel, right? <laughs> YouTube is a website where you go to watch funny videos about cats doing stupid things. Anyway, YouTube, and we put a semi-permeable membrane in here. This membrane allows water to pass, but not the solute molecules. So on this side, we have pure water. And on this side, we have pure water with a solute. It doesn't matter what the solute is. And so what does nature try to do? Nature's trying to make these equal. If the membrane wasn't there, it would just mix, and it would all become equal in time. It would take a little while, but it could do that. But the membrane is there, and it's preventing the solute particles from mixing over here. But the water molecules can pass. So the water molecules will pass in this direction more than they do in that direction. And that will cause the concentration of this to decrease. It will also cause the level of the liquid in this side to rise. So this level goes up, and this level comes down. Again, not something that you would expect to happen. You know, if you just put water in a U-shaped tube, it's not going to do that. You can watch it for the rest of your life. It's just not going to do that. Well, the membranes can be made of, of lots of things. Um, you could make them out of pig intestines or something. Um, there are, you know, you can make them out of synthetic substances too, or you can use things from living creatures or plants. Yeah. Um, if you've done much cooking at all, um, sometimes the directions will tell you to soak your salmon in brine before you put it on the grill. And when you soak a meat in salt water, it draws water out. And so, you know, that's good in moderation. So here's a story from my newlywed days. Um, my husband is Japanese. His Japanese grandmother 
um, had a great affection for hot dogs, and so she incorporated them into many traditional Japanese dishes, which is really just funny when you think about it. Anyway, so we were poor graduate students, and um, so one of our kind of go-to meals was teriyaki hot dogs, which are actually quite tasty. You make a pot of white rice, you get a package of hot dogs, you boil them in teriyaki sauce, which you do not buy at the store, you make it yourself. So you boil the teriyaki hot dogs, and then you eat them on the rice, and it's actually really good. Well, my husband was working late, as usual, and I left the hot dogs in the teriyaki sauce to keep warm. By the time he came home, they were as hard as rocks. Because teriyaki sauce is equal parts of soy sauce and sugar and some liquid. There's a lot of salt and a lot of sugar, so it's got a very high concentration of solutes. And here you have the hot dog, which has a semi-permeable membrane on the outside. And all the water is being pulled out of this hot dog. So I learned, you take them out of the teriyaki sauce and just put them in the fridge and, and, and nuke them in the microwave later. We just threw those guys out. They were just, you could almost pound a nail in them. So this happens. This goes up. What did we learn about pressure and different levels of liquid in tubes? If we were using this as a manometer to measure the gas pressure, we would understand that there's a difference in pressure equal to the different in the difference in the heights, right? So we use this as a measure, we call it the osmotic pressure. And the osmotic pressure, you're like, but well, well, where's the pressure? The osmotic pressure is the pressure you would have to exert on this side of the tube to prevent the osmosis from happening. So the level of the concentrated solution rises, that results in a pressure difference, and that's called the osmotic pressure. So it's the re pressure required to stop the osmotic flow. And this has this equation. This is a capital pi. The osmotic pressure is equal to the molarity of the solution times the temperature in kelvins and the ideal gas constant R. So pi equals MRT. If you are, you know, thinking about heading into a medical field, in medicine they care a fair amount about things like osmotic pressure and osmosis because your body cares. Calculate the osmotic pressure in atmospheres of a solution containing 1.50 grams of ethylene glycol, that's the uh, antifreeze, in 50 milliliters of solution at 25 degrees Celsius. Well, osmotic pressure, capital P, equals capital M, capital R, capital T. So we need the molarity and the temperature in kelvins, and we already know what R is. So mass of ethylene glycol, volume of solution. So 1.50 grams of ethylene glycol, we need to convert that to moles. So we use the, uh, the, equa the formula that we're given, and we calculate that. 2 times 12.01 plus 6 times 1.008 plus 2 times 16, uh, 62.068 grams per mole. So that's the moles, and then that needs to be divided by liters of solution. Well, we've got 50 milliliters. Well, can we convert that in our heads? Yeah, we go one, two, three. So that's one over 0 0.0500 liters. Now, sometimes when people do milliliters to liters or vice versa in their heads, they don't move the decimal point enough times, enough places or too many or something. So if that is happening to you, write it out, because that's a dumb way to get an answer wrong. So
So the molarity is 0 0.48334. That should have three significant figures. So osmotic pressure is the molarity 0 0.48334 moles per liter. Pardon me? It's a capital pi. We're used to lowercase pi that's got a little curve in it and is smaller. It, it kind of looks like a table or something. It's a pi. The molarity times the gas constant, liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin, times the temperature in Kelvin, which is 298 Kelvins. So Kelvins cancel, moles cancel, liters cancel. Just love it when that happens. Times 206 times 298 equals. I'm getting 11. Point eight. Anybody else get that? That's a high pressure, isn't it? So if you set up this solution on one side of a membrane and water on the other side, you'd have to have a pressure of 11.8 atmospheres on the solution side to prevent osmosis from happening. Pretty significant. I don't know why you would want to prevent it. Maybe just to see if you could? I don't know. Well, you've heard of reverse osmosis? Reverse osmosis is doing the opposite of osmosis. How do you do that? With pressure. So there's a reason. Just just kind of came to me. That was a really long section.